We have finally uh, completed John chapter 1 and now to make into make some progress into John chapter 2. And tonight we are considering verse 1 through 11 of John chapter 2. I hope you've read ahead. Um, as you know, um, the title is The Wedding in Cana of Galilee or the Miracle or the Miraculous Sign, one of the first of the seven signs of Jesus where Jesus turns water into wine. So as I mentioned, we are finally done with chapter 1. Chapter 1 where John the Baptizer, John the Witness announced the arrival of the Messiah. And then we saw how Jesus has collected a few disciples. First was John the Apostle. And then there was Andrew. And then Andrew's brother, Simon Peter. And then Philip and Nathaniel. And that's where we ended in chapter, chapter 1. And now Jesus is about to start his public ministry. And it's amazing that his first order of business is attending a wedding in the little town of Cana of Galilee. And his public ministry will last from this chapter, chapter 2, all the way through to John chapter 12. And it will be nice if you can read ahead. Sister Ursula sent me again something. I trust that you are, are reading ahead, studying the passages, but also memorizing good Bible verses from John's Gospel. So where does our Lord's public ministry start? It starts at a wedding. And this wedding is in Cana of Galilee. Let's read John chapter 2 verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called or invited and his disciples to the marriage. Wow! Here's a wedding and Jesus is invited together with Mary his mom and together with his disciples. So let me just interject and make two, two very quick points of application here. The Bible says Jesus was called or invited. And let me tell you today as Christians, when Jesus was called, as you can see from this passage, when Jesus was called, Jesus came. And let me remind us that Jesus is always a call away. Jeremiah 33 verse 3. We just need to call on the Lord and He will come and He will answer us. He hears us. We saw that in, in Daniel chapter 10 as well on Sunday. Jesus is always just a call away. But the other thing that strikes me as I read that Jesus was invited to this wedding and that Jesus came, besides the fact that it, it, it shows how important the ordinance of marriage is to our Lord. In fact, God instituted marriage way back in the book of Genesis. And Jesus chose a marriage, a wedding ceremony, and a wedding feast to start his public ministry. It shows how important weddings and marriages are to our Lord Jesus. But it also strikes me here that this couple truly had a Christian wedding in every sense of the word because Jesus was there. And what disturbs me today is that too many couples have a godly wedding ceremony and then they have an ungodly reception and then they think that they've had a lovely Christian wedding. Today we invite Jesus to the marriage ceremony but we leave Jesus out of the reception. A true Christian wedding is when you invite Jesus to the reception as well. And this couple had no problem having Jesus there at their wedding feast. John chapter 2 verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. So we see here, trouble strikes the wedding. They run out of wine. Now why is this such, such an issue? Well you see, wedding feasts and wedding uh, um, ceremonies in those days were a prolonged affair. The wedding feast could last usually, it was not unusual for a wedding feast to last up to seven days. And so to run out of wine at the wedding is really like today running out of food at a wedding today. And someone has to run off to KFC to go and buy a couple of buckets of chicken. And so this was very, very embarrassing for the wedding party. And it was even regarded as a disgrace. And if you read some of the history books, it will tell us that in some instances, the offending family could even be fined for running out of wine at a wedding. And here you see Jesus' mother, Mary, probably trying to find, uh, uh, find help, uh, feeling the embarrassment of the wedding party, trying to help and find a way out. She says to Jesus, they have no wine. 
Now, she's not saying to Jesus, make a plan. She's not instructing Jesus. She's not asking him. She's not even saying, make more wine. All she is doing, listen very carefully, all Mary is doing is acknowledging that there is a serious problem at the wedding. And Mary presents this problem. She presents this dilemma to our Lord Jesus. And that in itself is a very good example for us to follow today. That's why we have that beautiful song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Oh, it's so unnecessary. What needless pain because we don't take our grief and our pain to Jesus. Mary takes a problem straight to Jesus. And how does Jesus respond? Jesus says, verse 4, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. In other words, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Woman, what does this have to do with me? Uh, we would probably say it in, in a much more uh, vulgar way. We, we would say something like this. Don't make your problems my problems. And you have to note here, Jesus calls Mary woman. He does not say mother. He does not say mum or mummy. He calls a woman. But in the language of the day, this was not speaking disrespectfully to Mary. It is a title of respect in, a, in the same way that we would address a lady as lady or ma'am. And what Jesus is trying to emphasize here is that he now has a different relationship with Mary. Jesus no longer has a mother-son relationship. From this point on, Mary as his mother no longer has a parental responsibility over Jesus. In, other, in actual fact, Jesus now has sovereign authority over Mary. Jesus now acts exclusively, no longer in obedience to his earthly mother, but Jesus now acts in complete and exclusive obedience to his heavenly Father. And this includes the timing of his so-called debut as the Messiah. And this is why Jesus adds there, Woman, mine hour is not yet come. In other words, it's not yet his time. And so this wedding in Cana of Galilee heralds a, the dawn of a new relationship between Jesus and Mary. No longer son to mother. It is now long now. Jesus is answerable only to the will of his heavenly father. And so on this wedding day, Jesus starts on his father's business. And his mother's business has now ended. It's the dawn of a new era as it is. Does Mary take offense? Is she hurt by our Lord Jesus' remarks? Definitely not. She immediately accepts Jesus' new role and his authority over her. She has no problem with what our Lord Jesus has just said to her. And so she beckons to the servants in verse 5 and says, Mary saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Whatsoever, underline that, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. She simply turns to the servants and instructs them, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever he tells you to do, obey. And do you know that these are the last recorded words of Mary? And we always make a big fuss of what was someone's final or their last words before they died, whatever the case is. And let me tell you what excellent, famous, last seven words of Mary these words are. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. By way of illustration, when J. Sidlow Baxter was 16 years old, his mother handed him a Bible with the words inscribed in it. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And let me tell you what a great life motto or mantra this is to give to our kids, but also for all of us to live by. Just think of it. Three quick points there. In that sentence, our obedience to Christ must be entire. It must be complete. It must be total. And so when it's, that's why Mary says, whatever, whatever he says, that speaks of the scope and the range of obedience. Whatever he says, do it entire obedience but our obedience to Christ must also be exclusive whatever he says our obedience we are answerable to God and God alone and so we talk about exclusive obedience to his word but our, our obedience to Christ must also be specific so it is entire it is exclusive but also specific whatsoever he says to you do it don't do some of it 
Don't be, there mustn't be partial obedience, not something like it, not equivalent, but you do it. Specific obedience to the word of God. And so I want to challenge us today, whatever your situation is, let us adopt this verse, the famous last seven words of Mary. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. I love that. Another point of application that you can make from Mary's last words, when in trouble, when things go wrong, do two things. When crisis hits, be like Mary. One, you flee to Christ. And number two, you follow his command. Flee to Christ. Mary came straight to Jesus and said, the wine is finished. And the second thing we do in a time of crisis, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. So what command does Jesus issue? John chapter 2 verse 6, and, and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews. So this water was used for cleansing purposes, containing two or three firkins apiece. That's 20 to 30 gallons of water each, and it's about 100, between 100 and 150 liters. And here's the instruction. Jesus saith unto them, verse 7, fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. See, there, there's that obedience. Whatever he saith unto you, do it. Did the servants listen to Mary and follow her advice? That what was the advice? Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Oh, yes, they did. Because the Bible says they filled those water pots up to the brim. They probably did not understand why Jesus made this weird request and instruction. But they obeyed nonetheless. Because Mary said, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Then Jesus ushered another, or issued, sorry, another command. And they listened to Mary again, and they obeyed Jesus. What did Jesus say this time? He saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. Did they obey? Yes, the Bible says, and they bear it. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Now picture the scene. You can imagine what was going through the minds of the servants. Jesus is saying, there's the water, the water from the cleansing pots. This is water for purification, ceremonial cleansing water. It's not really healthy. It's not for drinking purposes. And Jesus says, listen, draw that water out. Take some water out and take it to the governor or the master of the feast. Probably like a wedding planner that we would call today. I mean, this is now putting their jobs on the line where they're taking this water from the pot and taking it to the wedding planner. But they remember Mary's words. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And so they did it. And they obeyed entirely. They obeyed exclusively and they obeyed specifically. Of course, what they did not know, the good news, the miracle had already taken place. That that ceremonial cleansing water was now turned into wine. And what happened, verse 9, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, he didn't know where it came from, how this was possible, but the servants knew. The governor of the feast calls the bridegroom and says, verse 10, and says unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when, all, when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. So you know, in, the, in, in those days, the usual practice at a wedding was always to serve the best wine first when the guests would notice it and appreciate it. And then later on, as the wedding progressed and as the days grew on, they wouldn't notice when they served cheaper wine and therefore they wouldn't complain. But now the head waiter comments to the groom, listen, you guys are doing something different here. You guys did differently. Why? Because you kept the best wine for last. Can I give you a spiritual application very quickly? The world tells us, and even there's a pastor in America who has a best-selling New York Times bestseller book, Live Your Best Life Now. That's the world speaking. The world tells us, let's eat, let's drink, let's be merry now, for tomorrow we die. Jesus says, I'm keeping the best for last. And so the message to us as Christians today, as tough as it is, it may be tough now, but tomorrow it's going to get better. We may be sorrowful now, but joy is going to come in the morning. And the chorus says it so beautifully. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. You serve Jesus and be faithful to Jesus. And Jesus keeps the best for last. Verse 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. 
and his disciples believed on him. The word there for miracles is actually sign, meaning a miracle with meaning. And we know that John, in writing this gospel, is going to give us the seven signs in the gospel of John. And as we go through the book, we learn more about this, bearing in mind that tonight we've learned the first sign, the turning, the changing of water into wine at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. And when it talks about a sign, it means it's designed to show that Jesus is indeed Christ, the Son of God. It serves as a sign that, that uh, uh, manifested and validated the auth and authenticated our Lord's nature and our Lord's mission. And so by performing the sign, he manifested God's glory. He revealed to men that he was indeed God, but manifest in the flesh. And so through the sign, Jesus pointed to a major truth about God. And that's our passage for tonight. Let me end by just pointing out, this is a bit controversial, let me just end by pointing out two erroneous teachings or applications from this passage. Unfortunately, this happens. Let me tell you the first thing. Number one, the miraculous changing of water into wine in no way condones the drinking of alcohol for Christians. The fact that Jesus turned water into, into wine in this, at this wedding does not give Christians a license to drink. At that time, remember, the water was very unhealthy. It was unpurified, and so the water had to be mixed with alcohol to purify it. It was not meant to get drunk with it. So never use this passage as a license, number one, to serve alcohol at a wedding, or number two, for Christians to drink alcohol. This is not the point of this miracle or this sign. It's not the point of this passage. Secondly, have you ever wondered why the Roman Catholic Church worships and idolizes Mary as the mother of Jesus? And let me tell you, it comes from this passage. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that if or when you need something, you need to go to Mary, for Mary to ask Jesus. Because, based on this passage, when Mary told Jesus the wine was finished, what did Jesus do? He made wine. And so they teach that you go to Mary when you need something, because when Mary asks Jesus for something, Jesus can't say no to Mary. If you don't believe me, this is what Pope Pius IX in 1854 said about Mary. He says she has been appointed by God to be the Queen of Heaven and Earth, and even stands at the right hand of her only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. She presents our petitions in a most efficacious manner. What she asks, she obtains. Her pleas can never be unheard. Just remember, when you read and interpret this passage correctly, Mary did not ask Jesus for anything. Mary only stated to Jesus that the wine is finished. And at that wedding, Jesus almost rebuked, informed Mary that the earthly relationship was over and she has no right to talk to him about what to do and when to do something. He didn't, she did not answer. He was not answerable to Mary anymore. Jesus was answerable to his heavenly Father. And therefore, the Bible teaches us that we do not need Mary in order to get something from Jesus. In fact, Hebrews 4 verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, directly, boldly, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Beloved, let me tell you tonight, Jesus is all we need. Jesus can provide all that we need. And more so, Jesus can provide more than we could ever need. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for this. Thanks the Lord for this passage. Please, we still have a few minutes before the family meeting with our president. Um, let's spend some time in prayer and may God bless you. Good night. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the lesson that we could learn from just brief 11 verses, but so much truth, so much doctrine, so many valuable teachings and I trust, Lord, that we would be drawn closer to Thee, that we would be drawn into a closer relationship with Thee. And we thank You for this privilege that we have, that we have direct access to the Father through our Lord Jesus. We do not need anybody else. We have everything we need according to 
God's will for our lives. Thank you, Father. Please bless us tonight and give us all a good night's sleep. For we ask this in your precious name. Amen.